Hi, this is Joe Feeks, editor of Poultry Health Today, and with me is Dr. Jenny Frick. She is a poultry veterinarian at the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you for joining us, Jenny. Thank you. Now, you have a, at the American Association of Avian Pathologists, you had uh, a presentation with a very unusual name, too much of a good thing, question mark. And I guess the, it's really about lysine, but with a, a title like that, I, I'm guessing that this is something that you experienced firsthand. It is. So the presentation that I gave was a case report of a case I dealt with in the field um, where broiler chickens were brought into me at seven days of age with the history that they weren't growing as expected. Mm -hmm. And my primary role at that time was to do necropsy in the diagnostic lab. So I brought the birds in and I weighed them and they were about half of the weight they should be. And I thought, yep. Half the weight. They're not growing like they should. Yeah. Um, proceeded to open up the birds and look for lesions that might explain what we were seeing and didn't really find any lesions other than some gizzard erosions or ulcerations, which at that time wasn't that unusual for me to be finding in birds in the necropsy lab. So nothing really explaining what was going on. Yeah, because when something like this happens, it almost turns into like a CSI investigation, doesn't it? I do tell people I do CSI chicken. Yeah. yeah. So how did you eventually, with all the variables in production, how did you eventually trace it to lysine? I wouldn't say that it was 100% me who handled all the tracing. I worked with a lot of people in industry. Well, you collectively. Collectively. So um, at the end of the day, we worked with the producer, uh, the field service representative for both the hatchery and the processing plant that the birds were going to end up at, as well as a feed service representative from the feed mill. Mm -hmm. um, and together, we worked, through, we worked our way through diagnostics to rule out diseases. Um, I visited the farm myself and initially based on the history after I talked to the producer it turned out that they had had additional feed delivered on farm when they were expecting to require more feed but there was still pre-starter at the farm and so with that initial history right off the bat my primary suspicion focused in on feed. How come feed wasn't disappearing at the rate that it should have and a few other factors around that that could affect feed intake. But right off the bat feed was a focus. So a pretty innocent and I would guess fairly common mistake that could happen on any farm. Uh, we'd like to think that feed errors aren't all that common but mm -hmm. they do happen at the end of the day there's still people involved in all of these processes and we can make mistakes. Yeah. So specifically though what happened to the flock? You mentioned that they were growing at half the weight where they should have been. What else were you seeing? Um, so initially no gross lesions. Um, our initial submission only came from one floor of one barn. So in Canada, some of our barns have two levels, actually. Yes, I've been to those. OK, so I requested a resubmission from all of the barns, all of the floors, so that we could assess whether birds were affected to the same extent or if there were more severely affected birds, if we were seeing different lesions, to help figure out what path we needed to go down. Um, as we did that, still no additional lesions. And then at 12 days of age, we had an additional symptom, which was lameness show up. And so I had a, dif a different differential list to go through to try and rule out lameness, whether it was related to our initial poor growth story or if it was a different story altogether. Um, we collected, I call it bird in a bottle at that point because I have no idea what's going on. So we collected a number of samples and then prioritized what we wanted to do for testing and ruled out different things, contacted the feed company to try and find more out about the diet that was being fed and we enlisted their help to test samples. So the farmer in this particular case hadn't collected feed samples and by the time I arrived at the farm, a, rep a representative sample of, of what was initially fed wasn't really a, a viable option. There wasn't anything left. Um, and the feed mill was wonderful to work with. They were very open and in Canada we're not vertically integrated like in the States. So that's not always the case. It can be a bit of a challenge when you've got different standalone companies and fingers are flying in terms of potential blame yeah. for an issue. Um, but they were, they were great to work with. They helped and they disclosed some of their testing results. And they were actually the ones that came back and said, hmm, protein in this diet has flagged high, as have chloride levels in the diet. And when chloride levels flag high in a diet, the first thing to go back and look at is usually sodium. Sodium and chloride salt go hand in hand. They went back and looked at sodium, and sodium levels were normal to below expected normal for the feed that they were manufacturing, which really left them with one other area to investigate, and that would be lysine hydrochloride that they supplement the diets with for amino acid balance. Mm -hmm. And so um, at the end of the day, when the dust was settled and that flock was dealt with, they sat down with me and stepped through what they thought happened at the mill. 
And at that day, they'd had a delivery of feed arrive at the feed mill, or a delivery of lysine hydrochloride arrive at the mill and get unloaded. As that truck was leaving, the bin level sensor that alarms if a bin is getting full went off. And the operator made the assumption, because the truck was gone and everything had been unloaded, that everything was okay. That bin was full, but everything had been delivered into it. So the next ingredient arrived. They turned what's called a turn head at the mill, which helps them to deliver ingredients into different bins. And they proceeded to unload the next ingredient. The next ingredient was a major component of the pre-starter feed that got made for that particular farm that day. No other farm was on the same pre-starter. This was the only farm that was affected. They, I think they unloaded based on the length of the pipe leading up to the turn head and the diameter of the pipe and the density of lysine hydrochloride that they added about 300 kilograms of lysine hydrochloride into the wrong ingredient bin. So now, when you stumble across a situation like this, I mean, you can look at the, at least the circumstantial evidence, you know, is something like it flagged on paper or you do an investigation and you find out that this particular ingredient was, you got too much of it in the bin. But do you try to kind of recreate the crime, if you will? Like, did you do a study then yes. to try to recreate this? And One of the things that really bothered me about the case is that I couldn't come up with an explanation or a reason for the lameness that we observed in that flock. So there's, there's older papers from 1961 mm -hmm. that report reduced growth and lameness problems associated with excess lysine hydrochloride. But nobody's really given us an explanation as to why we see lameness. And when I necropsy birds and when I looked under the microscope at tissues from those birds, I wasn't able to find anything that would explain why we had lameness. Yeah. So we took a bunch of birds. We took about 500 birds and put them into battery cages and fed them a basal level diet with lysine levels representative of a typical diet. And we increased lysine by supplementing lysine hydrochloride at 2, 4, 6, and 8%. Mm. We divided our birds into those five treatments. There were 12 replicates, half of which we used for production data, and half of them we used for tissue collection and sample collection. So our production data is what I've gone through so far and analyzed. And we had statistical differences in body weight, body weight gain, feed ah. conversion, um, and feed consumption in those birds with increasing lysine levels. Body weight went down, body weight gain went down, feed consumption went down, and our feed conversion got poorer. Statistically significant between all five of our groups. So that was a big aha moment. That was a big aha moment. And then I've actually got video footage of birds trying to consume a higher lysine diet, and they are displaying behaviors that suggest palatability of the diet was an issue as well. Mm. When we look at the numbers in terms of consumption, despite the fact they reduced their feed intake, with the increasing lysine levels, they still increased, they still took in more lysine hydrochloride relative to the basal diet. So they had a true excess of lysine on board and there would have been several factors there that came into play in terms of reducing growth rate and body weight. There would have been amino acid imbalance. So there's been reports where if you have an excess uh, nutrient or deficiency, birds will reduce their intake. So in this case, we had an excess and they reduced intake. There also would have been lysine arginine antagonism. So increased lysine will activate the arginase enzyme, which will cause the bird to dump out arginine. This whole but chain it, reaction. It does, it, yeah. it, and it further exacerbates the imbalance between the lysine and the other amino mm -hmm. acids because of that. Um, and then there was clearly a palatability issue based on the video of the birds that we've got as well. So there were several factors coming into play. Now, we also took um, blood samples to run uh, acid-base analysis and look at electrolytes in the birds. I haven't got all of the data analyzed, but a preliminary glimpse at it, most of our values are within reference intervals. We might start to see some uh, significant differences in our lysine treatment, the higher lysine levels, but I need to run the statistics on it yet. I still, at this point, don't have an explanation for the lameness that we saw on that farm. No smoking gun there, No smoking huh? gun yet. Okay. Well, good work, though. I mean, it took a lot of effort to track this down. Um, what are the takeaway messages for producers based on this case? A good takeaway message, I, I like to recommend always collect a feed sample when your birds are placed. You never know when you're going to need it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a good idea to keep an eye on things. I mean, we didn't get these birds into the lab until they were seven days of age. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we hadn't realized they weren't consuming feed the way they should earlier, if we couldn't have taken action mm -hmm. earlier and potentially turned things around. Um, reaction time is critical sometimes. If our broilers are on the ground in Canada, we have a very short growth cycle. I've got 35 days. 
So at seven days of age, that bird was already one-fifth of the way through its time on that farm. Mm -hmm. And we were pretty far gone by that point to try and turn the things around. And we should make clear that, I mean, lysine hydrochloride is it's it's a good ingredient. It's a good thing. So too much it, of a it, good it, thing. Too much of a good thing. Making sure you've got quality amino acids in the diet for the birds is important, mm -hmm. but if you've got too much of a good thing, um, the birds will respond appropriately and they'll reduce their intake. Oh. Good detective work. Yeah. We've been talking to Jenny Frick. She is a poultry veterinarian at the University of Saskatchewan. Jenny, thank you again. Thank you.